The following segment of the Sports Narrative Radio Show is brought to you by Xena Communications. Home or office, your technology problems are one click or call away from becoming a thing of the past. Ask today about a free consultation in the DFW area. We're going to talk to our special guest, the offensive line coach of the Southern Miss Golden Eagles and a childhood friend of Mr. Jeff Feltman. Well. Bring on Coach Luke Meadows. How you doing, Coach? I'm doing wonderful. Make me, feel, make me feel good when you call me a special guest. Well, you know, you are a special guest, man. It's, it's big okay. stuff for us. Well, so, sometimes you got to be special to be a friend with old, uh, with, with old Feltman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are, we've all learned that uh, over the years. So uh, a little bit about old Luke Meadows. Uh, he started uh, the coaching days there at the uh, South Dakota State Jackrabbits. And, oh, yeah, uh, those were the good days. Yeah, those were the good days, right? Then moved on to Florida Atlantic, probably for the weather, uh, where he was the oh, offens- yeah. offensive line coach, and then moved up to offensive coordinator, uh, where you had, a, you had a few guys come through that program that have been pretty good in the, uh, there in Florida Atlantic, uh, Alfred Morris and Rusty Smith and a few others that have made the pros. Mm-hmm. And then moved on to Southern Miss uh, just uh, last, was it last January? Yes, sir. So under uh, head coach Todd Munkin, I believe that's how you say that. Yep. So, all right. So let's. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit uh, about the team itself. So you're coaching offensive line. You've been the offensive coordinator before. Um, how much do you feel you're involved as far as the the play calling or or building the game plan each week? You know, all line coaches always kind of a little bit different because what you're trying to do is make sure that to make sure that the protections are right, make sure the run game's right. When it comes to it, you've got 11 guys on the football field. I'm coaching almost half of them. Yeah. So it's making sure that uh, putting together the run game plan. And so, like just yesterday, we're getting ready for Mississippi State. And so I come into the staff room and I got a, a pack of papers, probably about 15 sheets deep, where it's kind of discussing. Mississippi State's defense and what we're expecting to do on plan attack and how it is that we're going to be able to run the football against them formationally and the different run plays we're using. And then uh, from a protection standpoint, what it is we need to be able to do to protect the quarterback, whether it be from a formation standpoint or the protections we get to run. And really, whenever you're creating a game plan, you always try to start with how we're going to run it, how we're going to protect the quarterback. So uh, the line coach has a big part of that. And uh, it's my job to make coordinator's job easy when he's calling the plays, but he understands exactly what it is that we're running and why we're running it, and uh, and how we can protect the quarterback at the same time. So, big part of what we do, but like any coach and staff, everybody's got different deals they got to do for your role to make sure the team can, can have success on Saturdays. Yeah, absolutely. And so, on on your team, is it is do you have like your center? Is he making the line calls? Is it the quarterback that's calling out the protection because that's such a much more of a popular thing in college football now. Uh, who makes the line calls as far as uh, deciding the protections? What I've done over the years is I've always tried to make it whoever I'm coaching is making the line calls. Uh, quarterbacks are all right, but I mean, that's the real. I'm a line coach. You know, quarterbacks <laughs> can be sometimes soft. We've got tough ones here, but uh, yeah. we've got good ones here. But I would rather have that in my guy's hands because they understand all the looks. And so our centers are making the calls and understand and putting us in the right spot. Uh, there's been, I got a good center. His name is Cameron Town. Very intelligent. Yep. Uh, very athletic. Last year was really his first year ever playing center. We moved in there in June before we even started the season. Wow. But Cam was making protections based on safety alignment on the hash, safety depth. It wasn't just even within the box. And so now what we get to is we're trying to have the quarterbacks and do it a little bit more as far as whether we're in a mic protection, who we're set with the mic, or if we're in a slide protection, who we're slide to. Most of the time we're going to get it right. But we don't always know the formation. Right? I mean, we're, we're a tempo offense, no hope, so we don't know how many receivers to the right or to the left as far as where the defense should be lining up. So we got to rely on the quarterback a little bit to make sure that he sees safety rotation. There. Because it's in his best interest that we get him protected, so we're getting him tied in a lot more than what he used to be. Yeah, and uh, Cameron, Tom, all uh, all conference too, so you got a got a pretty good up-and-coming guy there. So, uh, oh, yeah. So... Um, all right, so I want to talk a little bit more about kind of college football in general, then we'll get back uh, to the Golden Eagles there. So a couple of the things that have happened in the world of college football, and I wonder just kind of from an insider perspective, 
on what your thoughts are. Uh, the first thing, the uh, Northwestern students and n not being allowed to unionize as college football players. Uh, was there any talk about that on, on campus there? Was there – or amongst the players? Was that ever kind of a, a thought or, you know, the idea of compensation for these players? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um. Uh. I don't know if there's been any of those old players. I think I saw something on Twitter the other day about it. Um, I've been in fall camp for the last three and a half weeks, so uh, my house could have been on fire, and I wouldn't even know what was going on <laughs> in the world outside of, of, uh, of our campus. Uh, but I do believe that, that it's a two-way street out it, that the players do work their tails off, and uh, if we can be able to get them cross the tenants for, for what it is that they do, because uh, we tell our players all the time when they're making decisions, if they make a bad decision, they're making a hundred fifty thousand dollar, a hundred thousand dollar bad decision. You yeah. base it on, you know, what they're getting for their scholarship and what they're getting for their academic support, food, and meals, and all the other stuff. And uh, so that's an You know, no one's ever paid enough for what it is that they do. And uh, you know, you want players to do it because they love it, but you also understand that hey, uh, if we can do whatever we can to help our players, we're going to be able to try to do it. So the cost of attendance, I think, is a good start to it. Uh, as far as union and stuff like that, uh, I have no clue what, what it is they're talking about. I'm not for <laughs> it or anything. I'm just I'm on the train watching the train pass. So I have no idea what that is they're even talking about. There you go. Well, um, all right. So the the next thing I had for you, of course, you've been at some of the smaller schools, but you know you're playing Mississippi State, uh, a little bit of a larger school. Uh, the the difference between big schools and small schools in in college football has always been, you know, the the haves and the have nots, as it were. Um, when you're the small guy on the thing, what what do you tell your players when you're going up against these these big boys? What do you tell your players? Do you go in with that you know kind of the uh, you know Davy and Goliath kind of attitude, or do you just go out there and say, hey, we're just as good as these guys? I'd say we're just as good as they are. We give the, the team that we're playing. We give them the credit for being a good team and having good depth, and uh, the coaches of their teams doing a good job of recruiting. So we understand that maybe those kids maybe have a little bit more notoriety. They have more stars. Uh, when you look at the rival stars and you look at the guys that are great players, it doesn't always match up on them. Every single one of our players, when they look at a guy that went to Mississippi State and a guy that went to Southern Miss, they look at the guy in Mississippi State and they'll say, hey, you should kick that guy's butt in high school. And we get the same thing. You know, we played out Point State last year. It was a, a 1AA school here in their uh, HBC 1AA here in, in uh, the state of Mississippi. A lot of those guys are probably saying the same to us. I mean, when I was at South Dakota State, we played the basket. We talked about it all the time. And it, it's, if you see a guy and you're walking down the beach, you don't think, well, that guy goes there and start mixing better than me. No, it's, we give them their due credit. They're good football teams. I mean, Mississippi State was one game away from being in the college football playoff last year. And uh, but we don't back down from nobody. I wouldn't expect any team playing us to be able to back down from us either. Awesome. Well, Coach, I mean, it's it's not as if uh, that's a, a, a crazy by any means. I mean, you see a lot of programs over the years who rise up, and you have to have that mentality, I would assume, in order to be in that position in the first place. So uh, I, I would think that's probably a bit of an – that's that's not too difficult of a message to sell to those kids. Well, it, it's, and that's what that's what Southern Miss is based on. I mean, they, Southern Miss is the giant killer. So they used to go out. Yep. One year they beat you know, Alabama, Auburn, and, and Florida State. I mean, anywhere, anytime, any place. And that's what we're trying to build back is that it don't matter. I mean, I tell my kids all the time, whether it's my kids or if I tell the kids that I coach, you know, just because someone lives in a nice, beautiful house on top of the hill doesn't mean that they're better. And if you live in a nice, beautiful house, it doesn't mean you're better than anybody. Yeah, Coach Meadows, talking about those those giant killers, you got the big game October 3rd against North Texas. How are you guys going to be ready for that? <laughs> you're, talking, you're talking to two well, people who went to North yeah, Texas, Yeah, there's a the couple. Way. I did not. Uh, this is, this is Feltman, by the way. But, yeah. I completed the degree. Somehow. Dustin, Dustin and, and Mr. Bowers actually both visited that, that fine institute. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. North Texas last year, I think, was a little bit of a down year for them. I don't know what the reason may have been. I do think they got good coaches, I think. Coach Mack does a good job with them. They're a great recruiting area. Uh, we played well that night. Uh, I think they'll tell you they didn't play real well. Uh, they can give you the, the decision on why their year wasn't as good as maybe what it was before, but uh, any team in this conference is, is a team that can win. That's a nice thing about Conference USA. There really is no team that, that's going to necessarily kill you. Uh, anybody can win any week. Yeah, absolutely. That's very much true. All right, so – uh, let's get back into uh, your your area of expertise. So w when we talk about some of these offensive schemes, you know now it has become very much in vogue uh, in in college football the 
uh, you know, the, kind of the Chip Kelly, Art Bryles, the, you know, where the coaches are basically making all the reads for the players on the field. It's very, you know, it's the reads are kind of predetermined and all of that stuff. Uh, your idea and the, and the spread offense and, you know, kind of misdirection, all these things, uh, do you, do you, are you a fan of that kind of offense or would you rather go back to, you know, line them up and, and grind away with the running game uh, from the old days? Well, I think that football is a cyclical type of game where it'll go, it all starts back from, go back in the early 80s, kind of a quick history lesson here, I guess. In the early 80s, everybody's running the football. And then Buddy Ryan comes out with the 46 defense and they're running a bare front and they're shutting everybody down. So then offense starts going to a spread defense. All right. So the defense comes back to it and they start going with the 3 4 defense the Buffalo Bills are running. So the defense kind of had the edge, so now the offense starts trying to go tempo, and they start going speed and, and no huddle type of stuff. Yep. And now the defense starts adjusting, and so now all of a sudden you got teams that can defend the spread really well, but they can't defend the old school power and inside zone with 12 personnel or 21 personnel. And I think you're going to start seeing things kind of come back to that. Even if you look at, at the, the SEC, you know, the SEC is the old school Big Ten as far as teams downhill and pound it. You know, you guys are in Big 12 country where it's spread it out and throw it. You know, back to your original question as far as uh, liking that brand. Uh, I've done that. You know, we do that a little bit. Uh, we try to make the call and then give the quarterback enough options within the play that, that we don't have to change the call for it. What I found when I was a look team, that's what we kind of call this teams where you, yeah. you call the play, you look at the defense, and then you call in the, the, the best play possible. Is that uh, our best play is when, when I was at South Dakota State when we were in Ohio was when we just called a fast and win. Sometimes the coaches want to make too much of an imprint on the game instead of just letting the players play it. That's nothing against and our Bryles. He's had a ton of success with what he's doing. I don't know how much they do look at even anyways, but there's some teams that do a lot of the look. Yep. Uh, I think the teams that are having success maybe mix in a little bit of look, but they try to call plays and try to tempo people where they can't get set. Coach, where do you think the – which level of football do you think plays more off of the other? Would you say that the college game plays more off of the pro game or the pro game more off of the college game? Because it seems to me like the college game is sort of these these you know new offenses come out and they stay there for really long. Whereas in the pro game, I mean, you had you know the, the, the spread option, the run option, quarterback was a big thing for about a year and a half. <laughs> then all of a sudden so they get figured out a lot yeah, faster. Yeah, they figure out quick, quick. Well, I think what happens is in the old days, the college really based a lot of what they did off what the pros did. I mean, it's. I had a good stretch there where I was able to go visit the Houston, Texas for about five years and really steal a lot of their scheme and a lot of their technique. And then, uh, but recently, you know, with, with how colleges are running more spread, I think that the, the pro game is starting to adapt a little bit more to the type of quarterbacks that they're getting. Uh, but I think it's kind of half that. You know, if you get about half the teams in the NFL are, are, are adapting to the, to the college stuff and trying to get in touch with college people, how they're running the tempo and the spread. I mean, the Patriots are doing, not doing a great job with it. And then you get other teams that are trying to prepare guys for the old school NFL, like guys like Nick Saban, where they get 12 personnel and they got a true pro staff quarterback. Uh, but I think more now than ever, I think the NFL is probably following a little bit more from the college game than it ever has. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. We're talking to uh, Luke Meadows, the uh, offensive line coach for the Southern Miss Golden Eagles. Hey, Coach, it's Feltman. i got a question for you. I've always wondered this. When it when you're going into a new school, because you've switched a couple, um, how, do you, how do you go about assessing the players and then – as an offensive line coach, you know, you know, the head coach or the offensive coordinator has a plan that they want to do. How do you get the personnel, you know, what if what if they're not right? How do you address that issue as a coach? Cuz I mean, obviously you don't go into every situation with the right players. So how do you how do you assess that and then how do you fix something like that? Well, uh, that was almost kind of a two-part for me. Maybe it was a two-part. Uh, when I went to Florida Atlantic, I knew the offensive coordinator I didn't know Coach Delaney as an head coach. I, I coached against him when he was at Nebraska, but I didn't really know. But I knew it. I knew it. The, the coordinator there named Brian Wright, what he wanted to do. And so we were really on the same page with it. And then once we got there, it was a matter of trying to recruit the personnel that we wanted for the offensive system we wanted to run. But also understanding that you don't necessarily have everything you need in the cupboard yet to be able to, to cook that meal. So you kind of got to go with what you got for that first year and recruit to what you need the second year. Now, I came to Southern Miss, Coach Martin, when he was at Oklahoma State, was an air raid guy. 
and uh, he had you know, Wheaton and Blackburn and all those dudes that he could throw the ball up and score a bunch of points. When I came here, the reason I came to this job was because he wanted to be able to run the ball better, try to change up the airway into being a little bit more of a uh, more efficient run type of, of offense. So we put in a few things that maybe the airway has never had on it. When I got here, one of the big reasons I took the job, you know, some things were better at FAU, uh, or stayed at FAU, but, but wanted a challenge. Uh, Southern Miss probably had the worst offensive line I've ever seen in my 15 <laughs> year career at that point. I mean, it, it's, it's, and I, I told them that. I mean, it, 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 I'm not breaking down my guys or anything, but we played them at FAU and we looked at their whole line. And our defense wouldn't even let their players watch the film because their whole line was that bad. Ooh, wow. And uh, I don't know if it's because I'm a glutton for punishment <laughs> or because I, you know, growing up, you know, felt, you know, you know, my my, my dad and, and he oh, likes yeah. to fix things like everybody in South Dakota. You grew up on a farm and you try to fix stuff, but find new stuff. And, and I kind of got that in me, and I wanted to come in and try and fix it. And, the more, uh, the more rusty. They were as bad as I thought they were. It, it took that first spring. I was wondering just what the what the heck it was I was doing. And, the more rusty the that fall, tracker tractor better. is, the better. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Uh, all right, so actually a uh, couple of questions there on that front. Uh, how much do you have uh, say-so in the recruiting process? Do you, uh, you, know, do you get out there and, and scout anybody, you just go off of what the, the people say? How, uh, how much do you have on the recruiting side of things? Well, we've all got our own territories. So we kind of, we kind of stick primarily to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, my area has been the Florida Panhandle and the South Georgia, of course, the South Alabama. That's so I kind of have a couple of right there. I like, I got my recruiting area, I got my area, so I go out and I find players of every position in my area. But then I evaluate every lineman from every coach's area. And uh, I'll go through it and I'll put down what my thoughts are. I'll get it from the recruiting coach. I'll put my thoughts, my, my thoughts and I'll put a grade on it. And it goes to the coordinator. He usually just rubber stamps it and does whatever matters wants. And then it goes to the head coach, and then he either agrees or disagrees with them. But as we get further into the recruiting process, that's where I start getting really involved. Uh, right now, we've got a few, I think we've got three commits to the offensive line now, and I started getting really involved with them as soon as we kind of like that. I find them. I like to be as involved as possible. I find them. Obviously, it has a direct impact on, on me as far as what we do. We do in a little bit as well. Not a lot. Not a ton. You know, as far as guys from here, I think we got. A couple guys from Leo and Jeff and Cedar Bell that, that went to a Duke go out there, yep. Missouri City and uh, Lakeland and stuff like that. But we don't get into that just too much traffic. Uh, absolutely. And so when you're assembling this offensive line, when you get all this talent in, the, you know, there's a couple of different schools of thought. You know, some people say, I'm going to play the best five guys. I'm going to get my best five offensive linemen. And I'm just going to put them out there. And other people like me, I'm, I, I do scouting stuff for the NFL draft. When I look at a guy, I, I look and see what's his best position. And so if, if a guy, you know, has the, the skill set, you know, a little bit more agility or, you know, the, a little bit more mobility in the feet, I might make him more of a tackle or the longer arms versus a guy who might have a really great punch, might move him into guard or, you know, he can make the line calls. Where do you fall on the, you know, putting your best five out there or getting guys who are specifically like this guy is going to be a tackle kind of situation? What I try to do in, in the college game is I try to recruit all tackle bodies because the tackle can play guard and the tackle can play center. Our current center, Cameron Tom, uh, played actually as a true freshman at tackle. Cam's about six four and a half, six five, about two ninety five, and runs well and is really smart. Uh, so I try to take length and athleticism and intelligence is huge for me. Um, those are the main things because if you take the guy that plays center. Uh, he can play center, maybe guard, but he can't play tackle. So I want to be able to, my deal is, is for me to be able to put my best five out there, um, they got to be able to play multiple spots. And so as you look across our line, uh, there's really only one guy currently in our starting unit that hasn't played tackle for me at some point hmm. or that, that, that didn't maybe play tackle in high school. I've had, I've had some really great centers. I've never recruited a center out of high school. I've always he's either played guard or tackle, and I brought him in and taught him how to snap. Just because usually you think back to the centers in your high school days, it's usually the short, dumpy guy that was really smart, but they found a spot from in the middle of the line. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. So for me, if it's right, I want to take the tackles and, and great athleticism, and I'll teach them how to be a center. Yeah, and, and Feltman, it's like if you took, uh, you know, if you're going to scout high school 
baseball teams, you're going to take the shortstop. Oh, you're yeah. You take the shortstop, okay. and I'll play right. him somewhere else. All right, nice. You, you see what I'm saying? So yes. you're going to, if the guy is willing to, you know, able to play tackle at his high school, he's probably the best offensive lineman. So that's the guy you go get. And that, Good that, analogy. That totally makes sense. Uh, the last question I've got for you before we uh, get into a little bit of game day stuff. Uh, of course, one of the other big things in college football, and in fact, all football right now, is concussions. And, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are running a, an, a, a system where, you know, quarterback's an option a little bit. He's he's putting his head down and he's running uh, into that pile quite quite often. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, your O-linemen, all those guys uh, are going to get dinged from now and again. Um, what's your thoughts on, you know, the concussion issues? And, and I know, you know, there's all the protocols in place, but is it something that you pay special attention to or is it a little bit more of the old school, you know, idea of, you know, these guys have got to take care of themselves and be responsible for their own well-being. Well, in, in today's legal world, you have to take it all serious. Um, come, I don't know if the statute of limitations is on a guy that gets a concussion. He can come back on a coach 20 years later or anything like that. So, yeah. so you have to treat like he's got a concussion. Uh, the, the, the trainer's got to make that decision. We can't try to, to you know, try to, try to push him back or anything like that. Um, but there's more concussions now than what there ever was. Now, the players are bigger, they're faster, they're great more. Uh, you look back in, in high school days or college days, and I'm sure that's how to have a concussion. You make it up, like, my face looks away, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> there's, there's, there's people that have had a ton of concussions, but anymore, so you're going to try to take care of your body as best possible. I understand why they're doing it. They're trying to be safe about it. I think the NCAA's got a good plan. I think the NFL's trying to get a good plan together. Uh, as far as ways they officiate it, I think there's some, some really cool technology coming out right now in helmets that I think are going to lessen the impact on, on the uh, on the skull. Uh, and then that's kind of got a theory on it. I don't know if it's right or not, but I think a lot of the stuff is, is, is hydration-based. I think a lot of kids, you get concussions when they're dehydrated, which obviously happens pretty easy when you're practicing under the weather with the helmet on top of your head and you're sweating your brains out. Yeah. That that makes a lot of sense too. How much has that changed over the the last uh, how, however long you know you've been coaching the, the mentality of the the two days three days in, in those hot summer days? Uh, we covered that a few weeks ago, just re revisiting the Corey Stringer incident in, in Minnesota uh, a little over a decade ago. Um, is that something that um, you've seen a, a renewed emphasis or, or more of an emphasis at the NCAA level? Uh, it's as far as I think I heard you right on it with the hydration stuff, yeah. the way the practices go. Um, you know, it's, when I first started coaching college, it was two a days right away. And then it went from the first three days were one a days, and then they're all two a days. And then this year, I think we only had two two a days, and that was it. Wow. But uh, part of that is, is back then, you didn't have as much access to your players in the summer as what we have now. You didn't have a full time strength coach, and so you're trying to play catch up on everything. Yeah. The way it is now in our summer times, we get so much, especially with the new NCAA rules, is that we can be out on our players four days a week for about two hours. So we're out there, when they're running, we're out there watching. When they get done, we get time spent with my technique. We get a lot of time in the classroom. So you don't need as much time as what you used to because it's it's so year-round anymore compared to, compared to the old days. And then once you're on the practice field, we try to do it and treat it like a game. Our first half of practice is normal, and then midway through practice, we take a, a three-minute break where we try to, uh, the kids got to eat something to try to get their energy up just because all the studies are, we have an awesome strength coach, but all the studies that he's done as far as uh, uh, the effect on your performance if you're dehydrated or if you're not fueled properly with with, uh, with energy in your body. And then our strength coaches are out practice. They're walking around the entire time. They have many guys there. And so when our guys go out to practice, if they lose five pounds, they can't leave for, for dinner or, or lunch or anything until they gain five pounds back through drinking wow. a gallon of water or whatever it is. That's a little deal. Just See, that's sure huge to hear right there. That that's that is amazing to hear because uh, coach, one of the things that I've been railing on uh, over the last couple of years is uh, I'm huge baseball, even more so than you could even possibly imagine. Uh, by the way, Cubs up three nothing. Yeah, he's he's watching it right now number. as we do the show. So yes, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yes. awesome. Hey man, coach is coach is a Cubs fan too, well, so it's it all right. I'm giving him the update, but. 
Uh, one of the things I've been railing on, you know, everybody says baseball's having a down, down time, but I really think that, that with the concussions and the physical problems that are, that are coming from all of these older football players and, and now the young kids getting it, I think you're starting to see a renaissance from baseball, and I think the injuries are part of it because, it, you know, with the contracts in the NFL versus what you can get in, in baseball, why would you risk the injury? And though I'm glad to see that as a baseball fan, I'm, I'm more happy to see that you guys are taking these type of concussions seriously because, to be honest, most of the kids that you're going to coach at that school are never going to see a contract in the NFL. So their long-term health and whether or not they're going to be able to put together a sentence when they go to a job interview ultimately is what's really important. And, and I am very glad to hear that. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm sincere when I say that. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So, all right, we are uh, about to wrap things up here with uh, Coach Luke Meadows of uh, the Southern Miss Golden Eagles. So, uh, the last thing I got for you, Coach, so what's your game day routine look like when you're going to open this game at home, Mississippi State coming into your house? What's, uh, what's the day look like from the, from the start of the day till, uh, till the game's over? Well, this is going to be a little bit different because we don't kick off until 9 o'clock at night. Oh, so, man. Wow. Uh, <laughs> we got a late start. But if I have the word home, uh, usually, uh, I'll get up and I'll usually try to make breakfast for a family because I don't have to be a much but during the season. Yeah. We'll have a walkthrough. Usually, about 9 o'clock, we'll get the first we'll time we'll have a walkthrough. And then, uh, usually, especially for a night game, we've got a little bit of time off until about 1 o'clock when we pick the players up. Or early, it's about 2 o'clock when we pick the players up during the home. So, unfortunately, that time is spent. Usually, I'll get about an hour and a half of watching college football in. Or if I got two pictures over that, but the other hour and a half, unfortunately, spent pulling my yard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's weird. It's, it's kind of relaxing for me. I never thought I'd ever say that. Don't tell my son that because my son's 13 now, and I expect him to start pulling the yard for me now. What kind of what kind of mower yeah. you got there? You got a nice yeah. riding lawn mower? Or? Oh, no, it's a push lawn mower. Oh, he's it's, old it's, school. I'm, I'm going to try to do it like my dad. My dad made me use a push lawn mower until I went away to college, and then he bought a rider. Very nice. <laughs> I used to use and an electric then, uh, push mower back in Hot Springs. Uh, I, I remember those days. They sucked. Boy, boy, you're kind of mowing the dirt out there more than you're mowing any grass. Yeah, and it's always uphill because it's in the Black Hills. There it is. <laughs> when we're done with that, we'll come back and we'll use that pregame about four hours before the uh, pregame about four hours before the game starts. Uh, when pregame is done, we usually got travel. And then uh, we'll go and sit in our chapel as far as listen to the FDA guys. And then there's about usually two and a half, three hours left. I get about an hour to myself. And uh, I'll either watch a college game uh, in the office or I'll start and prep on the next week's opponent as far as this. Hey, cool. Take the stuff broken down and take into the different stuff. And then we usually got recruits on campus as well. So then you got to spend about an hour and a half with the recruits until the game time starts. Real quick, Coach, if you had an ideal start time to a, to your football game, what would it what would it be? Obviously, not nine p.m. Well, what's a good start time young, for your college? When I was a young coach, I used to love night games. I don't know, you know, play underneath the lights. As a young coach, uh, problem is when you got night games, your whole day is shot. And so, my favorite my favorite thing is when you got a one o'clock start or a big ten or an eleven o'clock start. You get up, play a game, game's done. Uh, so if you're on the road, you're back at a relatively good time. If you're at home, you're done by three. You can spend the afternoon and evening with your family. You can get your film grades if you're not so backed up that uh, that you're not completely exhausted by the time Sunday rolls around. So now it's an old guy. Uh, it's an afternoon, early afternoon game. Young guys love night ones, but unfortunately, I start to get older. What time do you think you'll get to bed after that nine o'clock game? Oh boy, uh, game probably won't be done until after midnight. Uh, the deal. Even if I try to get home immediately afterwards, I probably wouldn't be able to get out of the facility at home until probably one thirty or two. Well, here's uh, the thing, though. After the big upset win, and they're in the locker room partying true. it down and just tearing the whole city apart, then you know it might be four or five a.m. before he's home. We're going to see Coach. Right, we're going to see Coach when, Meadows when shirt we, shirtless on his shirt, win, jumping up and down. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> He's just jogging down the street. We're going streaking. Exactly. That's the thing. Yeah, Dustin does that every week. It's Coach weird. Meadows, we have we have a uh, we have a listener question real quick here. It, it it goes back to your to your scouting days. 
Uh, apparently, the best tackle that possibly you'd ever seen was a kid named Jim Rogers. Uh, your thought, your thoughts on him as a as a tackle that you know in the college realm. Oh yeah, tackle, tackle, six two, two twenty five, number seventy seven, the Knox Spring Place. Yeah, hell of a ball player. <laughs> <laughs> awesome coach. I, I, I never had to. I never. I was always jealous though because he had he had the flowing mane and the locks, and now he's cut it down. But uh, yeah. He used to run around screaming Hulk Hogan lines. It was amazing. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Coach uh, Coach Luke Meadows, Southern Miss. Uh, go out there, give them hell, beat up Mississippi State, and uh, yeah, I'm going to finish you off with the chant if you know it. If I say Southern Miss, you say to the top. To the top. There he is. All right. Thank you so Thanks, much, Coach. coach. All right. Thanks, Adam. All Way right. to go, man. All right. There he goes. <laughs> And uh, What's out there, Mr. Feltman? How about that? Look, he talks football. I mean, that's what you all want me to do. You said bring me a guest. Yeah, He's been, and, 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 and the fun, I've had him in the queue for eight months. This man's been waiting. I know, and I this know. Is, and, and that was the best on. we came up with. All right. That was great. So, yeah, we, we said he was going to streak shirtless and uh, <laughs> yeah. set the bar a little high on that Streak one. in the yeah. quad and beating Miss State. <laughs> hey, man, you never know. Find more by subscribing to this channel and visiting us at www.thesportsnarrative.com. Join us every Tuesday at 9 p.m. Central for a live edition of the Sports Narrative Radio Show hosted by Xena Communications.